not a lot to work with there. You have black ink on white pages. So if you're not bringing 100% into that black ink on white pages, um, then a lot is gonna be lost. You don't have the advantage of, of, of visual stimulus and of uh, all the other things we compete with and sounds and everything else. It has to be really, truly genuine. It has to be true. All right, gentlemen, what makes a writer? Is it revision? Is it discipline? Is it inspiration? Is it just the process in general? But in general, what makes a writer? That's where I want to start. Anyone? I think, well, I think there might, there's like two kinds of writers, right? There's writers who want to, and there's writers who have to. Um, I kind of feel sorry for both of them. Um, it's like, um, I think for a lot of people writing is a compulsion. I think it's something that lives within us. It's a way that we tell stories and pass on, um, the knowledge, information of previous generations, lessons, all of that. And it's, it's something that burns that we have to get out. Um, oftentimes, you know, um, we want to tell those stories. Um, and there's a limit to the way that we can tell stories orally um that we can we can get that story out you know homer taught us that uh that we when we write it down we can get it out to a lot more people which writer are you oh man um i, I like i've tried to quit writing so many times I, I i like and every single time i think about like how much i just don't want to write i usually sit down and i write about why i don't want to write and the answer pretty much becomes apparent to me that uh I'm stuck. I'm I, I'm going to sell here. Uh, yeah. I'm not getting out of this. Uh, so I might as well make some fucking money at it. <laughs> yeah. uh, <laughs> I remember I was talking about before that you, you, you've approached all these different aspects of your life where, where you were a business owner, a fitness enthusiast, obviously a, 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 a ranger and all that. But writing is this one endeavor that you you, you have kind of just stuck with uh, for like a, a long period of time. What, what do you think has just drawn you into that moment for so long? <sighs> I don't know. Um, it's it's something that like there's an ability through all of life's experiences that you can express something through. So whatever you're going to, whatever you've been through, there's an avenue for that to come out and write. Right. Um, you know, you take those experiences from from being in the military. Um, and that's great. Uh, that's a that's a great thing that allows you to exercise that thing that is within you that needs to come out. Just the actual action of writing that like, oh, I have something to write about. And then you go and you live a different type of a life where you're a business owner and now there's something there to write about. And, and you know, you, you live life to live life. And as a result, there is an opportunity to write about. So I'm not even entirely sure that I'm a writer at this point. I'm a person who's living their life who just can't help but have to write about those things. Um, and uh, you know, I, I'll, I'll, I like to think that I'll be a dozen more things before I'm gone. Um, and in, through each one of those things, I will more than likely write about them. You know, right now I'm an immigrant. I'm, I'm, I've immigrated to another country and I've got this other perspective and, and I'm living this life and I can't help but to sit down and to write about it. Uh, it's just a, it's it's a compulsion that I have. Yeah. Yeah. But like the best writers are the ones who don't lock themselves in a room. They you got to have life experiences to inform where you're writing whether that doesn't and that doesn't just apply to memoirists or anything like that it's you have to have life experiences to inform your writing to inform your characters and yeah. everything like that and you know leo scott because of the way he lives life has a deep well to draw from and uh 
I imagine, I want to speak for you, but go ahead, you know, for Martin. Me, I love it when you speak for, for me. You, you actually sound more elegant. Yeah. Uh, for me, it's like I'm constantly paranoid that like, okay, I've lived a good life so far, but man, I don't want that well to run dry, you know? So it kind of pushes you to keep refilling that and hopefully you it keeps informing stories and you keep going. But these people who say they ran out of inspiration or ran, dude, you didn't run out of fucking inspiration. You just locked yourself in a room or got bogged down in family life or something and quit living life. And um, kind of going back to the original question as far as you know, what makes a writer, kind of reminds me that that age old question with most human conventions is something born or made. I would, I would be of the camp that writers are something that are born. I think whether you're a people person or a bit more of an introvert, you know, you have like someone like Walt Whitman, who was a, a, a very gregarious and out there. And then someone like Emily Dickinson, who um, kind of challenges that form a little bit. Like she, she was quite solitary um, for at least large portions of her life. But what they have in common is that they were very curious and they were very analytical. And I think one thing that would, that makes writers is this tendency, whether before they've ever thought about writing is they tend to kind of uh, stand outside of, of events, even the events that they're a part of and, um, and take note of, of them. And uh, there is this uh, curious appeal inside, inside of a writer to sort of uh, either make sense of, of an event or to explain the event to others in a way that um, I would say um, makes the writer feel good and also uh, provides some sort of value to uh, who they're writing for. Yeah. Kind of, kind of pull, pull back from yours a little bit is this, this life experience and locking yourself in a room. Do you think that your imagination obviously is limited, it's limitless in some sense, but is most of your writing pulled from actual experiences? Are your characters based off of people that you know? Is those experiences, are you only writing what you kind of know about, like your job or uh, a certain situation within your life? Or are you able to totally immerse yourself into something that you actually haven't experienced in order to draw from that you maybe would want to experience? I, I don't think it's all one or all the other. Yeah. It's, I think it's just a necessary, if you want to rearrange words really well in a, in a way that makes people feel something inside, then that's got to be based on something that's somewhat relatable or, or based on reality somewhere. Well, it doesn't matter whether you're writing about science fiction or, or you're writing a, you know, a memoir or anything in between. You know, it, it's like it's got to be based in reality somewhere and it's just not going to come across as authentic unless it's coming from a place of truth, yeah. you know, but these like I think that's like one of the big things where, you know, the stories that don't grab people are the stories that people like I said, sit in a room and try to make up and create these worlds and characters without basing them on any sort of like like ground truth there. Like you can write about fucking fairies and unicorns and all this other shit. But like, it's got to be like their emotions or their thought process or the, you know, what informs their actions um, and the choices they make throughout your story has to be based on something that is relatable to people. If, if you, you know, want, you know, I think that's the difference between a story and just, you know, masturbating and fucking all over a page, you know, it's like. <laughs> You got to can make for a good Saturday night. <laughs> yeah. It's just, yeah, it's yeah you know. readable. like it, it's like, you know, a, a story has got to be, it's got to be ground somewhere, but like, no, I don't think, and to, to be like completely clear too, you don't have to, you know, immigrate to another country or pop trains or be in the military or anything like that. It's like, man, you know, a, a mom who went through a traumatic, you know, childbearing experience has a lot to draw off of there or and it doesn't have to be traumatic even right like it's like the joy of something or the sadness of something or you know all these different emotions but it's like man you have to i, I mean i find myself listening to people talk in line at the grocery store just to, in, in the grocery store line just because the way you write dialogue and the way dialogue actually happens in real life is yeah. you know it's like you got to get out in the world if you want to yeah. do that well and observe it yeah, yeah absolutely and like the, the like Re reality and truth can be f the feeling of being trapped in a room. Mm -hmm. You know, you look at like an Emily Dickinson, right? Like, and you, you look at these uh, writers who, you know, have, you know, depression or they're, they have anxiety, social anxiety, and they're in this room and they're writing those things. They're writing from a place of truth. And it's not like that is an experience, a deep uh, well of human experience that they are articulating that then resonates with other people who are sitting, feeling trapped in a room. It's real. It's true. So like, 
the the notion of like experience again you're absolutely right it doesn't require you to to you know have to to go out and to do these really wild and crazy type things is that you really connect with the reality and the truth of you know of hopefully of of not just yourself but through yourself of other people and uh, you know humanity as a whole if you end up being a really successful writer mm -hmm. So we were talking about earlier about method writing, and so you're actually immersing yourself within that. Can you expand a little bit more on that of like actually putting yourself in those moments that you want to write about, and then expand a little bit more about being this third person kind of observer, even like within this setting or any setting, like the difference between this first person I and then this third person ob 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 you know what I'm trying to say, this, <laughs> this all knowing being right now. Uh, I want y'all to kind of expand on that. You want, you want to go first? Um, yeah, like, I, I don't know if like method writing is cheating. Maybe yeah. it is, you know, um, if I want to, if I have a scene where I'm going to write where the character is really hung over, um, I'm going to drink a whole lot the night before and I'm going to write that hungover scene for that character really hung over. Um, it just to feel it and to like, to understand the misery that that character is going through so that whatever's going on through my brain, you know, it's like, man, my tongue feels swollen and all I give a shit about right now is a yellow Gatorade. And just to continue to write about yellow Gatorade and my tongue being swollen, to understand that in hopes that when somebody is reading that, that, that they connect with them. Well, I, I definitely have been right there before, but that's the honesty of it. That's the truth of it. And, and to whatever extent to, to, uh, that you go to, you know, pushing yourself up against whatever line it is to really understand what it is that you're writing um, and not faking it, you know? How bullshitting it um, was it uh, William S. Burroughs, uh, you know, one of the beat writers that uh, the guy was uh, his, his kind of uh, opus or whatever was Naked Lunch. And he writes about his experiences in heroin and that these like these wild trips and the extent of it. And, and he would he would say, like, I could I could pick somebody out uh, immediately who's never been on heroin, who's writing about it. I can, I can I can call them on it immediately. They're not writing from actual experience. They're they've maybe they've seen, um, you know, this uh, in in other people, and they're trying to write it from that that that. But they're trying to put themselves in that bit. I'm not advocating that people go out and use heroin in order yeah. to be able to write heroin effectively. But I, there is <laughs> that's yeah. that's the way that you're going to write heroin effectively is having done heroin. Yeah. I just the. Uh, you know, the way that you're really going to be able to write war effectively is if you have really experienced war and not not the you know, not all of what we see, you know, typically in movies and the heroism and all that. But all of the, the gritty brotherly love and the jokes and the and all of that stuff, when you experience that, you realize that that's really the meat and potatoes of that uh, of that human experience and to, to bring that out and bring that forth. Um, you know, and if you, you, know, you call that method, it's like. It goes down to like, OK, really being uh, tapping into the experience of what it is that you're trying to convey to other people so that it actually really, truly resonates with them. And it, it, there's not a lot to work with there. You have black ink on white pages. So if you're not bringing 100 percent into that black ink on white pages, um, then a lot is going to be lost. You don't have the advantage of of, of visual stimulus and of. Uh, all the other things we compete with and sounds and everything else, it has to be really, truly genuine. It has to be true. Yeah. Um, let me uh, ask kind of a, a pose a question. Is, is, are you asking um, Leo's question about perf like a preference or at least a tendency to, to method write as, is, is it like maybe potentially something that's contrasted against a person who well, no, because like is, steps outside into the margins and analyzes. Like you said, you only could truly experience the heroin experience if you actually experience heroin or mm -hmm. war in, in a sense. But there are people who write about war or write about love or write about the fire service or about any in drinking beer, or getting drunk or whatever that mm -hmm. haven't actually experienced that and they see it. They're imagining themselves okay. and all that. But kind of more specifically, what I would want to talk to you, what you expand on is. That, that observant space because I feel like as, as writers you're you're constantly living in two spaces this physical world and then it's like kind of writer's perspective yeah and anyone anyone who's in a relationship with uh, I'm sure knows yeah. about like yeah and, like, and that's, that's that's more specifically <laughs> what I wanted you to kind of expand on is is like I, I catch myself even living in these, these different spaces where I'm experiencing this conversation as as, as Tyler in this moment and then well, every once in a while I pull myself out and I'm like 
how, how can I pull something from this for other things in the future? You know? Well, it, it definitely, for me at least, makes it difficult to live in the present because you, you, I have this tendency personally to sort of just constantly like digesting experience and be like, oh, wow, I could see I could do something with this. Or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, so it is a bit of a challenge, but um, I would say, I guess my answer to this would, would, would be, so we're talking about heroin, right? <laughs> so let's say you have a family member who uh, suffered an uh, overdose is if you're if you're someone who's a, maybe a writing soul okay let's say you're not a writer you 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 experience the loss you experience the grieving whatever your grieving process is and then something happens after you you move on you visit the tombstone a writer probably doesn't just do that a writer might go a bit more like well what caused this and 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 what would have the alternate universe has been like if just one factor would have been different and that might be um, something that ends up being uh, a memoir. It might be high fantasy. You know, you can drape the whatever the uh, uh, evils are in that person's life, you know, into um, more fantastic elements or whatever. But I think it's a way for if somebody is someone who, is, who kind of whether they want to or not sort of stands out on the margins is it's a way to um, commit almost. I don't want to use the word therapy, but it's a way to analyze and pick apart uh, triumphs and tragedies uh, in your life. And, and it's um, something that you're gonna do whether you put it on paper or not. And so there almost becomes this point where you're like, well, I may as well make something of it. Yeah. <laughs> so they, it's, it's interesting, like the, the, the human experience that you're having, right, is you're focused on that element, right? Like, it's what's the difference between um, somebody who is a uh, rock climber and somebody who likes rock climbing, right? Somebody who's a rock climber is looking at things that they could climb all the time. You know, like they're thinking about ways to, they're analyzing their environment based on that, that aspect, right? Um, they're, they're, they're looking at, at lines in places. They're thinking about ways to strengthen their hands, you know, at all times. And I think a writer is somebody who there's kind of like a narrator going on in their head. They're analyzing the situations that they're in on a day to day basis of how would I write this scene and and like, oh, and then this person came in and there's their, their mind is working in that way. You know, and I think that there's a, just about anybody can can control their mind into working that way. If you're if you're focused, like our mind is a very amazing, malleable tool. And if we want to be focused on this thing, we can be focused on the thing and we can become great at that thing. Um, we can tune our mind from being um, a, you know, from being a climber to being a writer or vice versa. Um, but it is the experience that we're having on any given moment, um, how we are analyzing our surroundings. I think is kind of what determines that like, okay, that's kind of what I am or who I am. It's what is the, the, the really that is, how is my mind working at any given time and at all times? Yeah, I think that there's, you know, one man's method writing is another man's research, right? And, you know, you could call Hunter S. Thompson a, a method writer. Or a research know? fiend. Yeah, like <laughs> it, it's, you know, if you and especially if you're inserting yourself into the story like that, or or making yourself a part of the story, I think that's like one of the most fun writing that you can do is when you kind of get to parachute into your story here and there. Um, but uh, overall, though, I don't think that it's entirely necessary to go do heroin to write a heroin scene. Nor do I think you have to be a serial killer to get inside the mind of a serial killer to write an effective villain or things like that. But I do think that you have to research the ever living fuck out of it. And uh, and ultimately, you have to have a huge capacity for empathy yes, to be able absolutely. to put yourself in the other person's shoes and imagine how they got to that place where they were doing that thing, whether it was, you know, falling in love or, you know, mass murdering people. There's been some, you know, really effective villains uh, written out there just by somebody going out and, you know, literally going to the local prison and interviewing, you know, the closest thing they could find to an evil person, you know. Um, and I think that if you're doing, a, a, there, there's a couple, but there's, I guess what I'm getting at is there's more than one way to conduct research. You can do it yourself. You can go live the experience yourself, um, which is the most fun way to go about this. Uh, or you can go talk to people and do that in depth. I think that, look, 
you know, I, I think that there's people that, um, whether it is war, I think what is obvious to people who've experienced something and calling out writers is when that writer didn't do their research. If you didn't research fucking writing right. her a heroin scene, it's going to be very obvious to somebody. But I think that a talented writer who did their due diligence could probably fool a drug addict, you know, as far as like, oh, man, they totally fucking get it, you know. Oh, man, this guy has literally never picked up a joint in his life. You know, but if he did his he or she did their research correctly, um, I think it, I think it's possible. But like capa capacity for empathy is, I think, a huge part of writing. Absolutely, hundred percent. I think it's an interesting way to put it because I, I was talking to David earlier about it. It's like I, I can almost agree or see somebody's point of view almost on any given situation. And I, and earlier I was talking about it, it's like this this prisoner does subjectivity, and it's like I'm able to just put myself in that situation because of that empathy and I'm like mm. yeah I guess I see why they they believe that or they see the world in that that point of view and then it, it almost doesn't put me on a foundation on, on on certain ideas or certain beliefs so do any of you guys have that issue or like you're, you're creating these characters and you may get lost in them at times whether it's fiction or or trying to write somebody else's perspective but within storytelling do you guys get lost in the story ever I mean, I don't think I get lost in it so much as you wonder if you're doing the character justice, whether it's a real person or a fictional character that you're, you want to do right by that character. Yeah. Um, so sometimes I can get a little bit frustrated, I think, with uh, how I perceive, uh, you know. You, you obviously have, each one of us have our own opinions or our, our point of view of our life and how we would have handled ourselves in that situation. But if you want to stay true to that person, you do have to use certain jargon or use certain words or use certain idioms in, in, in any capacity in maybe something that you don't totally agree with. Uh, are, have any of you ever had those issues of putting yourselves in those situations? Well, this reminds me of a story of uh, Aaron Sorkin, the guy that wrote the screenplay for Few Good Men. Uh, I mean... Colonel Jessup's speech about you need me on that wall. I mean, that, I mean that, that's famous. There are college like football coaches that that yell that at their <laughs> at their you know team before they go running out there. I mean that it, that really resonated with a lot of people for over decades. Aaron Sorkin he's gone on record. He goes, I don't agree with a word of it, but he was able to um, go. All right, well this is a Marine Colonel who feels this way. So how do I? How do I feel that way, if you want to call it that, while he's writing it? And, and yeah. I think that speaks back to what Marty said, which is probably one of the, the keystone elements as far as what makes a writer is not just empathy, but an extraordinarily lo extraordinary level. And it, it's, it, it is pretty fascinating because I, I write mostly fiction now is to you do get this kind of weird feeling when you step into a, a character's boots and uh, you are kind of able to see uh, a world or a perspective that you know you don't agree with. But for that that period in time, you can at least uh, again empathize with it. So, yeah. yeah. Well, it seems like a question of getting to a point with a character where you're asking yourself, "Is this what I would do in that situation, or is this what this character would do in that situation?" I think it's easy to project your own values and decision making. Um, it's hard to imagine what a completely different identity would do, um, and that's more than a question of empathy. I think. Or maybe I should say, is, I think empathy is, is a question of imagination, your ability to imagine that um, allows you to then feel similarly or feel in a sort of parallel way to that character. Um, I've been thinking this whole time we've been talking, y'all have been talking, about uh, the movie The Lighthouse. Maybe y'all see that? Yeah. A couple of guys live in a lighthouse longer than they'd like to. And like, that's a war movie to me. Um, it's never mentioned, no, no aspect of that is military related. But you got a guy who thinks he's gonna live in a lighthouse for a month, ends up living there much longer. <laughs> and that day when he finds out that the replacement guys aren't coming, I was like, oh, I've done this. I've been in that situation. That writer didn't need any military experience to convey that sense of isolation, of loneliness, of uh, disappointment and sort of despair when a calendar suddenly goes from a, a set date to an indefinite one. Um, and so I think that research lets you understand the sort of situation around a character. Um, 
But at the core of all of these experiences is the emotional content, what it feels like to be there. And you can feel lonely in lots of different ways. You can feel sad in lots of different ways for different reasons. But that sadness or that whatever the emotion is, I think is, is a through line that lets you get into other characters or lets you get into experiences that aren't your own. And that's, and it brings up an interesting point is, is where, what's the relationship between em empathy and imagination? You know? I don't know. Interesting. <laughs> well, it does seem, it does seem that someone highly imaginative would, would, I mean, it seems like just as a, a sort of a reflex, you'd be like somebody who's highly imaginative would probably have, have a higher capability of empathy. But also somebody who has a high degree of experience has a, a higher, typically more empathy. If you've mm -hmm. been to more places and you've experienced different cultures, um, uh, you've, you tend to have a greater degree of empathy because you can understand other people's perspectives on yeah. things. And, and we all writers read. That's, oh, that's the other thing. If, if what makes a writer is, is reading constantly. Yeah. And that is a form of travel. That is a form of time Absolutely, travel. Yeah. It is a form of, of, of geographic travel. And uh, you can step into more people's lives uh, that way uh, that you don't get with some of the, the modern mediums, you know, like like you step into a character in a book 200 years ago, or you read a book 100 years ago, is that, you know, you can uh, experience a time and a place and a mindset um, that is better than any movie. So with that, do you guys all read a lot as you guys write? Or do you guys try not to let your reading influence y'all's writing? It's no, much. it's part of your fucking job. Yeah. If you're a professional writer, do your fucking job. Yeah. Like you need to read. Constantly. You know, like, it's part of the job. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, that's, I mean, it is, it is for me now, finally, it's like part of the daily routine. It's like, these are the hours for reading. Um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think people like, so I teach creative writing workshops and a lot of new students come in and they say, hey, I really don't want to read new stuff because I'm worried about copying that person then if I read it. And what I say to them is that, you're gonna copy them if you don't read it. You don't know what other people are saying. So right now, whatever you think is original and new and interesting has probably already been explored somehow. So if you wanna do something new, you need to know what's happened already. I think that the more you read, the more ideas you get to sort of take the next step from what that person's doing. So if you like the way you know Leo breaks a line, you're going to think about how to do that your own way. Now, certainly there's a risk that you might fall into imitating, you know, and that's like, that's something you need to be on guard about or you need to look out for. And that's where, you know, we talk about revision and being self-critical. You need to keep an eye on what you're actually doing and not be on autopilot with those decisions. I think one of the things that makes a writer for me, or I think that's important is being able to make decisions rather than just following inspiration. Inspiration gets you started, but, decisions are what makes your voice your voice Absolutely. yeah and also like to that point of people being worried about like oh i don't want to be influenced or copy a modern writer if you're reading them that means they're published that means they ref refine their craft they've gotten to the point where you're they're even on your radar that's like saying i don't i'm a basketball player i don't want to watch michael jordan because yeah. i might be as good as michael jordan yeah <laughs> exactly. i might copy so hold on sport like <laughs> yeah you got a couple steps to go yeah. before you can worry about let, let's and let's, i think i think it's all right to imitate a little bit at, at first you know what i mean yeah. like if this is somebody who you who really inspires you kind of find their line and do exactly to your point like and then find where you kind of break away from mm -hmm. it a little bit and then and then if if that you know that you, you find this kind of pocket writer this style of writer that works uh, and then you might find somebody else and you'll imitate them a little bit. You take a little dash of this style, a little bit of that style. You get some of your own experiences. And before you know it, you know, really that you've created a whole new dish out of all of these different ingredients that really the, the main bit of it is your own self. Yeah. Um, and yeah, like, but again, you, you like, you don't want to. <laughs> without knowing what came before you, you'd be stepping on those things and think that you were really original in this thing that you did. And it was really like, yeah, no, like that actually got published 10 years ago. Yeah. Uh, it already, it's been done. Well, the, uh, the irony of originality is the fact that, is that I, I know a lot of brand new writers, they think they're just going to fall out of the sky and just, you know, you know, you know, uh, just, just, just come up with something that just, just completely just reexamines the human condition and, you know, 
they're carried through the streets on the work, works of lesser men and everything. And you come to find out that, the, as Leo said, um, is that originality only comes after years and years of, of digesting the, 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 you know, people who came before you. And you just kind of, it's one of those sort of standing on the, the shoulders of giants concepts. And that, um, and what I would say, not that this was the question, but if someone were to say like, you know, like, you know, like how do you obtain originality is that you don't really have to worry about it is if you read long enough and you write long enough, the uniqueness of, you know, there's only one of you, right. Is that that will inevitably create a unique perspective, but you got to do the work first. And this is a great segue into what else makes a writer a writer. They fucking write. They put the reps in. Yeah. You're not yeah. going to arrive at any of these stations uh, that David and Leo are talking about unless you're actually getting out there and writing. You're not just reading every day, but you're writing every day or, or writing on a, a regular cadence. Otherwise, you're not going to make those evolutions of finding your own style. That doesn't happen. I mean, yeah, it's it's like you actually have to sit down and write on a regular basis to to get to where these guys are saying. Marty, are you uh, do you have like a, a goal to hit each like a day or a week with word count or anything like that? No. Is that no? My my metric. What's is, your cadence? What's your what's your? <laughs> my metric is: Do I feel like I have surpassed a level that I could not be accused of being a shitbag? Okay. Uh, okay. No, I, I, I think, you know, for me, um, uh, at the risk of sounding egotistical, I feel like I've put a lot of reps in at this point, and a lot of my writing at this point comes in, in a few different varieties, especially since I, a lot of what I do is nonfiction or, or journalistic. A lot of my writing is the, the research aspect of it or conducting interviews. A lot of it is um, I'm a big believer in uh, ideation and and working through a story in your head before you actually sit. I think that the putting the words on the paper part is actually, now that I've done it enough, like I, I feel like that's the easier part. Um, I think when you're first starting out, you get really wrapped around the axle about like what word I'm using or what adjective I'm using or, you know, and it's like, dude, that's- I'm still there, Mark. Yeah. Like, <laughs> but like, I, I, th I think that the, the, the important part is to work through the story and figure out your character arcs and your story arcs and, and the beats that you want to hit. So by the time you actually do sit down to write, you're you're really pumping out the words and and everything so i tend to as far as like my cadence goes i think i tend to write in spurts at this point as far as like actual keyboard right. but i think that writing at a certain point becomes more than just literally Absolutely. hands on a keyboard i couldn't agree but more. i you know anybody that's like just starting off writing i would 100 percent say like no you need to sit down and write every single day and work through, like develop your style like i feel comfortable where i'm at right now as far as like i kind of know what i'm going to get out of myself so I, I tend to, instead of like 500 words a day or 1,000 words a day, there's definitely times where I'll just, I've worked through everything in my head and I can pump out 5,000 words in a day mm -hmm. and be pretty, and it'll be like 90-ish percent there, yeah. you know? And I can feel like pretty good about that. Um, but that wasn't the case, you know? I just, I think all of us probably can look at like our early writing and be like, good God, like. <laughs> I don't like, I don't look at my earlier yeah. writing because I don't want to, it's really. Man, some of the earlier <laughs> And I don't mean to sound like it's not like, you, you know, I don't think any of us qualify as like super salty writers that no. have been doing this for decades or anything. Um, but I think that it, as far as like that, that first year or two, maybe that you're or if you're in a creative writing program or something, it's like it really is like you got to get the reps in. Yeah. Um, and then when you I think when you start to figure yourself out, that's when you can start to pick and choose how you approach your day of writing. Well, and to your point before that, like writing is happening in the line at the grocery store. Mm -hmm. And you want to talk, you know, to the original question of what makes a writer, a writer's phone is not in their face in that moment. They're observing. And to be a good writer, I believe vehemently that first you must be a great observer. Yep. You have to observe your surroundings. And when you're there listening to that dialogue, that is, I think, what you're talking about. It's like, that's where you're writing. You really are in that moment. You're listening to the way that people communicate in that environment where they're tired and it's at the end of their work day and they're, you know, that all of those elements, you're taking in that bit of, uh, about a, a bit of humanity. And, you know, after enough of that and working it through your head, then there's the point where you finally, you know, regurgitate all of that onto, you know, onto a document. Um, yeah, there's, there's a lot more to writing than just the, the, the typing bit. I think it's kind of like a photographer, right? Like a photographer walks around and they see everything as a potential photo or how would I, how would I frame 
this shot for like the best photo. Yeah, yeah. And I think a writer or a storyteller in general, right? You Whatever medium you see you the use. world through your medium. Yeah, right? you're yeah. constantly yeah. thinking like, how is that piece of dialogue or how is this interaction? How does that work into a story? I think your your brain is always in story mode or maybe should be. Yeah, because Graham, I actually kind of wanted to uh, pose. We're kind of we're we're going across the square <laughs> table here is because you're in a unique position, at least amongst us today, is that you you teach. So like like how do you balance the uh, uh, teaching others to getting your own work in? It doesn't feel like something that has to be balanced, um, okay. because at least for me, and this is different for everybody. Lots of people have different approaches to teaching, um, but I find that teaching creative writing especially is really generative, because students are asking you things like hey, how does a metaphor work? And I'm like, I guess I have to tell you. <laughs> I have to figure out an answer to that. Um, because I think when, you know, when we're writing, we're doing some of that intuitively, right? We're figuring it out as we go. That's not the same as trying to articulate it like a craft talk. Mm -hmm. um, so it forces you to, or at least it forces me to articulate some of the things that I have maybe internalized already. Um, and then question those things and think like, oh, is that really how I do it? Could I be doing that differently? How do other people do it? So I think being able to teach is a really sort of fortunate opportunity. And it takes a lot of time too, and you know, you're given a lot of energy to helping folks think about their own work. And I guess maybe the drawback is, you know, if you bring me a poem and you want my feedback, I'm struggling not to turn that into my poem, right? Mm, I can tell uh, you how yeah. to take this and make it something I would write really easy. Wow. Um, yeah. the struggle is to figure out how do I help you make this thing that you're trying to write? So you're both trying to visualize the same goal. Um, this is maybe the best crowd to appreciate this metaphor. I think it's a lot like doing known distance ranges where a person's shooting so far away they can't see where they hit the target. So someone has to stand on there and be like, oh, you hit it over here. You know, you put those markers on it. And it's, it's a little bit like that where you can both agree on the targets and then you can walk onto mm -hmm. it and get, mm -hmm. get everything zeroed. Or just call each other shit bags. And <laughs> right, you just keep putting the targets off. Marty, oh, you missed again. Before man. you! Marty, before you go any Practice further, trigger I, just, squeeze. I need to let you know, buddy, you're not a shit bag, all right? <laughs> we love you. This is, it's, but uh, we're still on the first prompt. Kind of shit <laughs> this, is, this is a very oh, affirmative spirit. Good. By virtue of being writers, we're all a little bit, we're all oh, yeah. the guys who are like, you know what, I'm good not having a normal job. I'm going to go over here and rearrange words. Right. For You're right. I don't like George your... Orwell said, yeah. all writers are vain, selfish, and lazy. Yeah. Like, uh, I, it's I a camera too there. I don't, want to... <laughs> I don't think any of us are <laughs> vying <laughs> for time person of the year. You know, like, I don't think we're on that short list. No. Long list, at least. I mean, I just yeah. met you, so yeah. I don't know. Maybe you're a fantastic person. I don't know. I feel like I'm close. Uh. Close, yeah. <laughs> He's Long. proving our point. Yeah, exactly. <laughs>